why, oh, why would you become intolerant to these yummy, amazing foods depicted behind me? Garlic, no, garlic <laughs> and avocado. And I don't know what I'm pointing to anymore. But anyway, you get the idea. Why would you not be able to tolerate FODMAPs? These are all really healthy, amazing foods. So what gives? Well, I'm going to try to answer that question for you in today's video and share some really cool research that helped me answer this question. This basically confirmed what I have been suspicious of for a really long time. Uh, I will say that this will surprise a lot of you and some of you might get quite angry when you hear this, but hold out because at the end of the video, I'm going to talk about what this means clinically, what you could do, how you could rectify this, and ultimately how you could reintroduce FODMAPs into your diet ASAP. So don't shoot the messenger, just bear with me while I share the research first, and then we're going to get into the application of this information. So let me put myself in head bubble mode first. Okay. The title kind of says it all. Gut brain axis dysfunction underlies FODMAP induced symptom generation in irritable bowel syndrome. What the what? Gut brain axis dysfunction? You don't say. That sounds like something we need to explore. So, what they did for this study, they took a, uh, a group of people with IBS, about 13 people, and they had a group of healthy normal controls, also 13 people, and they infused into the stomach of these people, either fructan, which is a FODMAP, or glucose, or saline. And they did this in on different days, spaced out at least a week apart, so they had adequate time to kind of recover from the last one. And importantly, none of the participants knew what they were receiving. This was a blinded study. They had no idea what they were getting in that tube. So either fructan, glucose, or saline was put into the stomach and dripped in, and then they did imaging of the abdomen and functional MRI scanning of the brain to see what the differences were between the healthy controls and the people with IBS. And the results were so fascinating and juicy. So if we come down here to the results, everything we need for this conversation is pretty much in the abstract. So I'm just going to keep it here. Uh, under results, they said, in IBS, fructan induced more cramps, pain, flatulence, and nausea compared to glucose, contrary to healthy control, with between group differences for cramps and nausea. Okay, this isn't new news, right? We have known for minimum 10 years, if not more, that people with IBS can have a hard time processing uh, high FODMAP foods, including fructan, and that it can induce cramp cramps, pain, flatulence, bloating, the whole kit and caboodle. So that's not the new news. They went on to say that fructans induced uh, fructans increased small bowel motility and ascending colonic gas and volume equally in IBS and healthy controls. What the what? This is the part that like some of you aren't going to wrap your head around. This is not the first study that has demonstrated that the quantity of gas produced in response to dietary stimulation is the same between IBS and a healthy control. A lot of us are taught or led to believe that we need to chase the gas thing. We need to decrease the gas production and chase that. And that might not actually be true. It is entirely possible that you are producing a normal amount of gas, but it is your body and your nervous system's response to that gas that is abnormal. So they go on to say, pain-related brain regions responded differently to fructan in IBS compared with healthy controls, including the cerebellum, supramarginal gyrus, anterior and mid-singulate cortex, insula, and thalamus. These brain responses co-varied with symptom response in IBS. Holy macaroni. Now I can get out of head bubble mode. Let's talk about this. So first off, like I said, don't shoot the messenger. I'm not trying to be a meanie pie. I'm not trying to tell you that it's all in your head, you're crazy, etc. Just take an antidepressant. That's not this conversation. But my point is that, again, a lot of you are chasing the wrong goose. You're on a wild goose chase trying to decrease the gas production, and that's not necessarily what you need to do. And I realize that this is a mindfuck, and I realize that some of you don't believe this, but I'm going to share just like a quick little anecdote from my life when my tummy was kind of squirrely, and then we're going to get into the practical application. So story time. 
Uh, the hyphenated version of this story is I was at a conference and they had a buffet that I knew to be gluten free. And it, it was like an integrated medicine conference, you know, so they're pretty hip with this. So I had a wonderful breakfast at this conference, including a bowl of what was labeled as coconut yogurt. So I sat down, I ate this meal, it was wonderful, it was delicious, and then the first lecture began, and I'm sitting there in the lecture, and it just kind of dawned on me out of the blue, oh my god, I did not verify what was in that yogurt. Because it occurred to me, that could be coconut milk yogurt, or coconut flavored regular dairy milk yogurt. And at the time, I was not able to eat dairy. So I start kind of freaking out a little bit, honestly. And basically 20 minutes goes by and I am wigging out. I can feel the cramps and the bloating. I could visibly see my belly doing this. I could visibly see Prego belly coming on. And I vividly remember thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna have to unbutton my pants at a professional conference. This is so mortifying, oh my God. And finally about 20 minutes into this, feeling quite wretched, I decided to go leave the lecture and I found somebody who worked for the hotel and I asked them to verify what was in the yogurt. A minute later, they come back, they say, nope, you're totally good. It was coconut milk yogurt. There's no dairy in it whatsoever. And I kid you not, it still boggles my mind to this day. Within like 60 seconds of hearing that the food was safe, all of my symptoms went away. 100% of them. Like I'm talking prego belly that was out to here. I was getting ready to unbutton my pants, just whoosh, back to normal. The cramps, the, the churning, the bubbly feeling, everything went back to normal within 60 seconds of my nervous system learning that that food was one of my safe foods. So that was a really big mind fuck. Like I, I still can't believe it to this day that it happened like this. So I tell that story to say, even if you have outward expansion of your belly and you think that's reason enough to believe that there's increased gas production, I'm here to tell you that that might not be the case. I saw that dissipate in a matter of 60 seconds before my own eyes with my own body before I knew any of this stuff. So anyway, quantity of gas may or may not be the thing you need to be chasing. It's up to you to decide that and kind of wrap your head around that. But going back to this idea that gut-brain axis dysfunction underlies symptom generation relative to FODMAPs, that means that we have this tremendous, tremendous opportunity to rehab your gut-brain axis so that you can reintroduce these foods. And then you can skip on your merry way, farting with the unicorns, under the rainbows, and everything. So what the heck do we do now? Well, this is, there, there's a lot to this. You can look at the really broad perspective of what does the nervous system need to be healthy and happy, right? And I'll tell you the foundational things. Your nervous system needs to be appropriately stimulated. It needs to have a stable, healthy fuel supply, namely stable, good blood sugar. And you need to have adequate oxygen delivery. So things like iron deficiency, B12 deficiency, folate deficiency, any sort of anemia or hypoxia becomes really, really important there. So foundational, unsexy, basic things that you could start focusing on to improve your nervous system health are blood sugar, oxygen delivery, and stimulating the nervous system. Things like getting exposure to bright light during the day and not being exposed to bright light in the evening social engagement, connecting with people, connecting with animals, the world around you, mother nature, just connecting with things, trying new experiences and new hobbies, pick up painting, pick up guitar, pick up whatever. Like I picked up painting the pandemic for crying out loud, like try something new and stimulate your brain, do a Sudoku puzzle, go hang out with somebody new, go to a concert, do something. But your brain loves novelty. It loves acquiring new skills, it loves learning new things, and our brains really need to be stimulated, particularly beyond what you're doing right now. You're learning something new, but you're staring at a screen, not interacting with other human beings in front of you in the flesh. So get off of your phone when the video is done and go interact with the real world after, you know, after I share the rest of this and hopefully you want to do so. So 
that's the really kind of broad strokes. Stimulate your nervous system and focus on blood supply and glucose. Those are some really big tenets. Now, there's this whole wide world of stimulating the vagus nerve. And how do you do that? And what does that look like? Um, Amy and I have an entire hour long podcast episode dedicated to exactly that in the season of season two of the IBS Freedom Podcast. So go check that out. I will share with you the really uh, abbreviated version of this is that the vagus nerve is all about connection. It's all about connecting with real life human beings in front of you. It's about connecting with the world around you with something bigger than yourself. It's the nerve of connection. This idea that we can just gargle into oblivion and that's going to stimulate our vagus nerve is such a joke. It's not even funny. The idea that we could buy essential oil blends and supplements that stimulate our, our vagus nerve for us magically is absurd. We really need the connection. We need to experience our lives in some way, even if it's small. Even if you feel like you can't go out to a party right now because your IBS is too bad, you could still text a friend and say, hey, I was thinking of you. You could still shoot an email to somebody and say, hey, this made me think of you. I hope you like it. We could still find little ways to connect with other human beings, even if we don't feel ready yet to leave the house. And that's what the vagus nerve is all about. Again, if you want more of a deep dive, Amy and I have a whole podcast episode on it. I talk about this a ton in FODMAP Freedom with my students. That's a really big emphasis of my program is just learning how to stimulate and regulate your vagus nerve. But these are the things that we need to start thinking about more and maybe focusing on gas production and the bacterial boogeymen a bit less when it comes to IBS and SIBO. And ultimately doing so gets great results. I've been helping people reintroduce FODMAP foods in FODMAP freedom and in my private practice for many years. And I have a really great track record doing so when they are willing and able to actually stimulate their vagus nerve the correct way. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.